Okay, I'm, go I'm going to now hand over to uh, Peter McKenzie. Uh, I'm, I, as you can see, I'm trying to, I'm not trying to do the gender thing. Uh, I'm doing the, I'm doing the age thing. <laughs> so, so, Thanks for the compliment. Yeah, uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, Peter McKenzie is, uh, he was part of a collective called Afropix. Uh, and he has been also um, avid photographer, but also now more recently uh, the uh, director of the Durban Center for Photography. And I've seen some of the work that you are doing there in Durban and bringing out the uh, uh, unseen side of Durban. Yes. So um, I think, apart from, uh, of course, uh, doing most of his work been through the lens, but I think he also is very much engaged in uh, discourses around photography, representation, and, and, and the archive. So. Thank you very, very much, and thank you, the Market Photo Workshop and the for making this possible. I think it's a really, uh, hopefully we look at this occasion sometime down the future and seeing this is a really auspicious moment where the importance of the archive really is brought to bear. Uh, and it's not only the photography archive, it's about narratives. I think this is what uh, Mike was talking about. It's about the oral narratives that are lost that actually accompany uh, uh, photographs. We, we often talk about photographs as saying, my photographs speak for myself. Well, I don't believe that photographs speak very much without the voice of the author or the context that the photographs were taking in that actually adds new layers of meaning to the photograph at the Desperate Center for Photography. We use a, a definition of the photograph as being a two-dimensional representation of a reality, not to reality, a reality, your reality, your subjective reality, and with a three-dimensional meaning. Now, the context would mean to ask what happened before the photograph was made, what happened after the photograph was made, and using the contents of the photograph that drives, we call it the kind of advanced advanced form of this, I think it's advanced form of visual literacy, where you look at the image and you say, what are the elements that inform this image? What is in the frame? It's the first question. And I, I, and I ask my students to list man walking down the road, dog, cat, son, whatever it is. And once you've listed those, you should ask the second layer to, to, to try and enhance the second layer of meaning. You should ask, how do those elements relate to each other? And I would, I would think that when you think about how, when it's about deriving meaning from inside of the photograph. Can you just hold, hold this slide just for a few minutes? Uh, before I get there, I know it's a very compelling slide. Um, and to think about using a notion of visual literacy or how you read images to bring meaning to the photograph. Or we can have many, many different readings of the photograph, but I think it's one way that we've enjoyed in order to, to, to glean meaning, to create meaning, to change meaning of photographs, and also to look at visual literacy as an act of photography. Because when you're out there, standing behind the camera, looking through the viewframe, that's what you're doing. You're looking at your world, or the way you frame your world in a particular way where you bring your own subjectivity to it. And so what you're doing in composition and in composing the subject is you are looking at elements that are in front of you and saying, well, how can I make these elements work into an aesthetic whole, if you like? Um, I digress terribly, so let's, let, me, let me go back. I want, to, I want to speak about a project, and I think maybe some of you heard me teach this a long time ago, but very, very briefly, it's a, what I'm calling a history. Once again, not the history, but a history of African photography. And it makes a very, very nice acronym called HOPE, and that's what I'll refer to, H-O-A-P. Like, um, okay, which has a very nice, nice ring to it. Um, and to look, to look at, at the history of African photography in four eras, or four epochs, if you like. And the first one being, uh, you can, you can, you can go. the first one being is what we see now, is what I call the colonial gaze, or the, the, the implication of the photograph in racism. Now, when we look back at these colonial images, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen them, and, and understand the, the weight of these images in terms of the creation and the notion of the other, and how we how the earliest use the, the camera was in Africa. I think
think it was three or four short years after the first the gyro type was manufactured in 1839. So that's how important the powers that be who own this means of production, if you like, saw this instrument as a moment that it could be used to exploit other people. So these type of images were made under this guise. Is that we one, it's an anthropological study, they introduced the notion of Darwinism and evolution, and, and these images of these people were considered to be that missing link in evolution, the connection between the ape and the human. And this is how the earlier, so when you think about how race has become central to the dialogue in South Africa today, we've got to go back 150 years to actually start to realize the weight of race and where it comes from. That's why I have no, I, I really don't understand when people, when people talk about reverse racism, what they're talking about, because racism was a construct of a system to belittle the other and to oppress the other. Finish and club. There's no, there's no, there's no uh, arguments about that. Um, the, the, the second, the second uh, uh, um, premise I want to make about the archive, and it, it runs through uh, all these, these, these epochs, is, is the, the idea of the, the, the effect or the context of photography. What was the culture of photography during this time? What I'm talking about, what it was being used for, how, how we were being sold, if you like, even before <coughs> slavery, we were being sold down the chain, taken to the, uh, the sponsors of, of, of uh, of colonialism and saying, look, we can actually exploit these people, we can take their land because they're not human, this is what they look like, they look closer to apes, they've got no clothes on, they, everything that humanity is not. So this was the process of what I think the first instance of the dehumanization of the African and the third world continent. And we're still looking with that dehumanization today. And so this is what the archive presents when you're looking, reading the archive from the present, and you're looking back, these are the narratives uh, that are gleaned from them. But I think more importantly is, as time goes by, we start to see different things in the, in the archive. And just looking at these pictures and the selection I made, I start to feel a, a sense of owning the space, even though you knew that this was something alien to you that you, you might you almost knew what the process was, or we knew in retrospect what the process of these photographs and what the, how they were used, what would become of that. And so we, when, we, when we think about how the elements in the frame can bring meaning, I start to see in these photographs signs of actually determination, of self-assuredness, of almost antagonism and almost defiance to the act of photography. And I guess you have to want to see that in order to see it. Or you can take the classical anthropological narrative and just lay it over here and say, this is what happened. But I think the notion actually begins um, right there. Um, and I think um, uh, what's important is that the, the, the project should be driven by these visual literacy models uh, going forward. Looking at other histories, other perspectives, and different readings of the photograph, and I'll get to that in a little bit of The language of photography, and this is where I think uh, is something that also was bequeathed to us from the past. And uh, if you see, look in Susan Sontag's book on photography, she talks a lot about this. This notion of shooting, capturing, taking photographs, snapshot, all of And we still use these terms today. It's amazing how, when you read the narratives of the fees must fall, the cops were shooting on one side and the students were shooting on So who's shooting here? Who's shooting who? And this language becomes so embroiled in this notion of the hunter, the notion of capturing, the original scene. And if uh, us, um, uh, my, my colleague Shireen will tell you, we banned that language at the Durban Center of Photography. You never talk about shooting a photograph. And I think changing the language into making a photograph, which is complicit, what you're saying is that between me and the subject, you people outside there, there's some chemistry that happens in the middle here. There's a complicity between me and the subject as the photographer that's very important. This is what makes the photograph, doesn't take it. Right. And I think this is really, really crucial because we're still using that language today. When I read Sam and Zima's narrative of that June 16 moment when he hit the, the, when he sucked and 
So, sorry. Uh, when he, when he hit the, 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 the rubber phone in his sock, um, he, he also continuously employs us language. The cops were shooting, we were shooting. I just wonder if there's something wrong here. I don't articulate it very well, but I think it's something that we could really be best thinking about. Moving on to, and this is a, a work I've done for the, uh, to for commemorate the, for the photographer who was just passed on Malik Sedebe, and I'm calling this the, 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 the kind of rehumanizing moment. So, the bearers who were carrying the cameras during the colonial period, the images that we've done before, probably learned the techniques by carrying these big cameras for the Makuru Blast, wherever they were going to photograph uh, people in the bushes in Africa. And that was bequeathed down to people like Sam and Sita from Malik Sidebe and uh, Seyno Keting, and who, who actually responded to this notion of shooting in a sense where somebody came into the studio and said, this is how I want to be seen. This is my perception. This is who I am. I'm taking control of the image. I'm going to bring my motorway into there because that's what I want to be seen. So this, this, this relationship between like, the space between the camera and the lens becomes really, really important in this collaboration, if you like, in reclaiming what I call uh, humanism. And in, the, in, in my title, I call it Benduga. It's a great Zulu word to, to turn around. And it's, it's a notion of a perspective being turned around and actually uh, uh, taken, uh, taken, taken ownership of it. I think the the, 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 the Marco phenomenon, Malik Sedeva and Sedicator, uh, are also uh, um, extensions of the theory of representation, which is really, really crucial when you think about it, is how photographs from the inception to when they're read by an audience out there and what is the narrative that happens in between the making of the photograph and representing. And I think sometimes we convolute this notion of represented, representation to a very theoretic level, and for me, in, in its simplest, various terms, it just means to represent, to present again. And I think this is what we're doing with the archive. We're presenting it again, differently, with a different insight. Because this is another period. Certainly in South Africa, I think when the, when the, when the chips are down, when we have more shit in this country than we can deal with, the archive history becomes a sense of nourishment I think, for all the artists that are being asked to answer the questions that have been asked today and the answers that we don't have are maybe found in, in, in these images. And then, um, just to, to, to come back to, to what Ramaik was speaking about, because this is, if this was, if this moment in Marco, it was post-colonial, post it was the winds of change, uh, it was the, the beginning of, of, of African independence, the whole, the whole narrative of the liberation of the African people going forward, it was, it was a time when it coincided for me somewhat, Ramaik, with the, what was happening in the, in the, in the 50s and the 60s in Sophia Town. There was this joyous self in okay, sorry. Maybe just go back one, one or two frames. And she is too far, so I'm talking too slow, but I can't do both. Um, it's this notion of this, what, what they call, just in the title, the title um, uh, in Sophia Town, what would be seen as this area, this era of awakening of intellectual and creative spirit uh, and all the fantastic people who came along during this area. It was coexisting side by side with what was happening in Bamako. And, that, and, and this is what I want this project to do, is to make this connection, these connections between different historical eras or aesthetics or schools of photography, if you like, that actually have a narrative running through them. Right now, I don't have those connections because I think it's still in its very, very much early stage. And this is what I, I'm just trying to, 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 to talk about now. Um, I'm going to go on to the next, the, so the first epoch, the colonial gaze, the, the racist camera, the second one, West African studio photography, turning the camera around, and in the third era, what, is what, I, what we're calling struggle photography, and even that is a contested term, struggle photography, but I'm being facetious by using this notion of the camera shoots back. Now, it's us who have the photographs, and you know, uh, Afna said, the camera as a, a weapon during the struggle for, for liberation during the, the, the 70s and the 18s, 80s. Okay, I want to just stop right there, yeah? Um, instead of, because I, I, I guess my colleagues spoke about that quite a lot, the, 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 the history of struggle photography is also very much contested terrain, as Bramaik and, and 
everybody else has mentioned. But I think what's important to, for me is to just digress a little bit from this and talk about a project that we're doing that's about to be published in Durban right now in the next couple of months. And it's called Masi Bumbani. And this project came out of um, a, a, a project that we were doing with the uh, MK veterans in Chesterville in, in Durban. And uh, it was a, a pro project with Dunja uh, Hunge from Dala. We were looking at doing an installation to it. The installation never happened. But out of this workshop, we had a conversation between young people and these grizzled old uh, MK veterans about the, the, the lack of understanding and knowledge that young people have about the history. And there were young people in the group who said, well, are we going to do something about this? And that's where the project started. We actually went out and started uh, um, uh, doing this project. It was very much informed by Santu's Black Photo album. I don't know if you know this work. It's a beautiful piece of work that should be really, really studied much more, I think, to, 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 to can make its connection with the past. And so we got a bunch of, of, of young people from, from uh, uh, the township, and we went into people's homes, just as Santu did, and we looked in their archives, in their albums, their family albums. Family albums are incredible, incredible terrain of, 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 of archival photographs. They're just incredible when you think about how certainly in South Africa, I can, I can let you turn off, how certainly in South Africa, there is this, what I think Lakhita called it, the master narrative, or what I would call the dominant narrative. <coughs> and how, for me, in today, how power in South Africa has actually subverted this dominant narrative to what Ramaik was saying, is that other narratives are not known, or marginalized, or actually completely, or intentionally just put to the side because it doesn't fit in with the broader narrative. Yes, five minutes? Okay, great. Um, so, we, we went out and we used this, we, 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 there, was no, um, there was no criteria for the quality of the photographs. It was whatever the family thought was a photograph that they wanted to be seen, that they wanted to talk about, that was the photograph that we chose. And we, we, we went into the albums, we, 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 took, we, we asked permission to take the photographs, took them back to, to our, our studio, scanned them in, and then took them back to the studio. And then as a group, we sat around these images. Can you just hold that one, please? Um, as a group, we sat around looking at the photographs and doing this visual literacy model that I spoke about just now, asking what's in the frame, how do the elements work together, what is the context of the picture, what happened before, what happened after, uh, and looking at the third dimension, the photographer who is the person behind the photograph and, and the viewer who comes to the photographs. Those components actually come together and meaning is then derived from inside the frame, right? Not from outside. It's, it's a way, if you like, of protecting the integrity and dignity, if you like, from my, of that narrative. So that it's actually steeped in this tenuous relation of the photograph with reality. And I'm going to end on this image because it's very, very personal for me. Um, I went in, I was working with a team one day, we went into a house and this woman knows it was, same story, we said, listen, this is what we're doing, and uh, we want to, can we look at your, can we look at your uh, photo album? And she, yes, we started looking, and then she went and brought this photograph inside, and this amazing, amazing thing, and this was an affirmation about the project, something personally, I think, always comes if you put a lot of energy there. The, 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 the man standing, um, the, the priest standing in the middle is Reverend William Duma, uh, who, very, very famous, they had a huge Baptist church in Ongeni Road in Durban. And my father was also Maruti. My father was an evangelist. And as a young kid, I grew up with Reverend Duma. Now, that was a little bit strange for a young colored person living in Wentworth. You know, that there wasn't many, many outsiders coming into the brain of township at the time. But Reverend Duma was a regular in our house. He also was the first and only black man priest at the time that counseled uh, princes on death row. They would fly him up, sit right at the back of the, uh, of the plane, of course, during this time, but they would fly him up to Victoria to, to go and counsel. And I often wondered about whether he, you know, when Solomon Shango was hanging, he was a guy who I, I, never, I never got uh, to, to unpack that. Anyway, so that's a written doorway in the middle. He baptized me, you know, right, for example, I was some of the church person at that time. <laughs> and, 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 and just, the, 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 we, we looked at every aspect of even of the body, the, the, the disposition of the body, how people stood. 
Did they stand up tall? Did they, what was their physiognomy on their faces? What were they trying to say with the expressions on their faces? What were they trying to impart to the photographs? And if you look at this, and I mean, I, 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 I smile about this because I like the way the photograph sloping down. It really speaks to the topography of Durban, you know, where it's hilly all the time and it's not flat. So little things like that, we, we really took them to heart and really started to construct meaning and a dialogue around the photographs. Second from the left is a guy called Cliffy Kumalo. Now, Cliffy Kumalo was Reverend Duma's translator from Zulu into English, or ever. In, in, any, uh, any, any way if, if Duma went to English, he would go Zulu, and, and it was incredible to watch. But he was in, as different from Zuma, he was a maverick. He, he was the only minister who buried people in Chesterville, uh, who was jailed many times, and his sister, his daughter, and also tells us a lot. So, in closing, I think that's a, a really the, 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 the idea of the, of the narrative, the ter of the historical narrative, and what I call the filters that we put over our lens when we look into the cameras, and what those filters are, make us see the reality of the archive in a different way. And that leads to what I would imagine would be contemporary meanings of that image. Thank you very much.